Okay, recording. Okay. So uh, first I'm going to ask you, John, just to give me your name, spell your last name, and give today's date, which is January 20th, 2019. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you're coaching me. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah. My, the end of the coaching. My name's John Denny, D-E-N-N-Y. Uh, today's date is January 20th, uh, 2019. And uh, can you start by just telling me uh, how long you were in the police department and how you got involved in, in law enforcement with regard to vicious and dangerous dogs? Well, I was in the uh, recruited to the police academy in 1985 and uh, uh, spent 29 years in the police department. And in about uh, 1993, um, I began working for a commander, a uh, San Francisco police commander, and uh, that meant that I was leaving a district station and was brought downtown uh, to work uh, with, as attached to the command staff. And one of his duties uh, was he had to supply a hearing officer for vicious and dangerous dog court. And uh, about the time I got there, uh, with another officer, a uh, sergeant, Sergeant William Herndon, that hearing officer retired and uh, the commander appointed uh, Sergeant Hernan to be the hearing officer and I was to be his assistant for Vicious and Dangerous Dog Court. So that started about 1993. So this was far be before the uh, Diane Whipple incident. So you've been doing this for a while when Diane Whipple happened? At that time, Vicious and Dangerous Dog Court was run by the health department and all they would do is notify the hearing officer when to be at the health department for a hearing. They were held just about every Thursday at uh, the Department of Public Health. And so Sergeant Herndon and I really didn't put a lot of work into it or time into it other than attending the hearing. And then he would dictate to me what he wanted the uh, uh, statement of decision to be. So uh, we were doing it once a week among various other duties. This was just one of many things that uh, we were assigned to do. So this is news to me. I didn't understand this before. So the Department of Public Health was running the hearing, but does that not? Were you guys not involved in investigating the the cases? You know, when someone accused a dog of being vicious and dangerous. Well, this will come up later, but back then, if you got bit by a dog in San Francisco, you'd call nine one one. And they would say, we don't handle dog bites, call animal care and control. Well, animal care and control would then say, well, we don't send anybody out for dog bites. Is the dog still biting? Is the dog running loose? And the people say, no, if, if it wasn't, then animal care and control wouldn't send anybody out either. Now, on the rare occasion that a police officer was dispatched to a dog bite, the police officer 99% of the time would say, it's a civil matter. And, uh, uh, Rarely was any action taken, you know, or rarely was the incident documented. So things, we, we come a long way, and it wasn't until the Diane Whipple incident that we decided that, wait a minute, we've got to take every call of every dog bite and even aggressive or menacing behavior seriously, document it, and take a look at it and do something. So what was animal care and control's role in that era then? Uh, basically, if the police uh, had a dog that was running through traffic or the, uh, a dog that was attacking somebody, well, the police officers would first have to do whatever they did to secure the incident. Uh, then animal care control was called to take the dog away. And uh, uh, they were basically uh, the custodian of the dog until it was determined what uh, the police, if they had an active case, if the dog was used, to, uh, someone ordered the dog to attack somebody, then it's a, it's a dangerous weapon, then there would be a police case going on, court, uh, things, things of that nature. Um, but generally, animal care and control's primary responsibility was securing the animal and keeping it. That, that clarifies something for me right. that I wasn't quite clear. I'm gonna, I was gonna run in and turn off the music. Yeah. I, 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 I won't. Okay, rolling. Okay. okay. So I just wanted to go back real quickly. Is there a time frame for that? Uh, that where, where um, I mean a rough time frame where the Department of Public Health handed off a lot to the Animal Care Control Department? The mid 90s, uh, some, some deal was cut between Animal Care and Control and the Department public health where they transferred duties and responsibilities to animal care and control. Now the fact that Sergeant Herndon and I were sitting in the 
in, in the squad room where our offices were, made it very easy for animal care and control to say, well, can you help with this part of the uh, setup? And um, it, it, it just was a natural fit and it was very smooth. And so you became a hearing officer in 2010? 2010, yes. And until when? Uh, well, I retired in 2014 and from the, from the, from from the police department. Uh, and then I continued uh, uh, as a hearing officer uh, pro bono for six months because the director at that time, Rebecca Katz, wanted to keep me as a hearing officer and was creating a position within the city as a hearing officer. And that job was created. I interviewed for it in about December. I retired in June of uh, 2014 and about December <laughs> is when I uh, actually uh, was a hired independent contractor for the city as the hearing officer. So I did that for two years, two, two and a half years until just recently. My contract's expired. When you say pro bono, they, you did not get paid for six months no. for being a hearing officer? No, but I felt, as uh, Director Katz felt, that this was just too important to call somebody in who didn't have... We had things running very smoothly, and, and it, it, uh, it was a steep learning curve. Um, I say that in all humility because it took, me, it took us a long time to get this thing running smoothly, make mistakes. Uh, city attorney gives you a call, says, you can't do that, you can do that, but then we always ask the city attorney first. Uh, it was more like, can we do this, and can we do that? Um, it was a, a very vague, vaguely defined in the San Francisco Health Code. It's uh, defined as an informal hearing without rules of evidence. <laughs> and, uh, well, what does that mean? And there still has to be some sort of uh, checks and balances to this or an appeal process, even though the Health Code says all decisions made by the hearing officer are final. Well, that's, you know, it may say that, but that's not the, the way it is. So we had to figure out how, how all of this thing worked. So we finally developed it, and I think Director Katz didn't want to reinvent the wheel uh, because then she'd have to train somebody, or the police department, or she'd have to leave it to the police department to train something, and the police department on the list of priorities in the police department, hearing officer, animal issues are on the very bottom of the list unless something major happens. So she didn't want to chance it because there were people who... <laughs> Director Katz did not want to uh, be hearing officers that were working for the police department, or uh, she would prefer them not to be hearing officers. And uh, so that's why she kept me on. And it, it was a labor of love. It was a labor of love. And uh, yes. So that brings us up to this whole transition period from like 2014 to 2015 16 when the ACC went through some changes. And how did that affect the whole problem? Uh, well, uh, Director Katz left. And so they did a search for a new uh, director of animal care and control. And they, ha uh, they eventually uh, decided on uh, Miss Virginia Donahue. And um, I didn't think anything would change. Uh, I, I had uh, no reason to think that uh, I, I would be affected. I always considered the hearing officer position as being independent <laughs> and uh, uh, unbiased and free of uh, interference. And uh, my first meeting with uh, uh, Director uh, Donahue, uh, she had different ideas <laughs> uh, to the point where she wanted to make sure uh, that uh, all of my decisions, she agreed with all of my decisions and even down to the wording of my decisions. And uh, then I, I knew we were gonna have trouble. Was she asking to review them in advance or she was just, she, she reserved the right to, to to get back to you on, the, on the, your decisions? Well, we our first meet and greet, we, we were sitting down and there was a case where three pit bulls jumped out of the open trunk. They were sitting in the trunk of a car with the lid open and a lady was walking her little white fluffy dog down the street. The pit bulls jumped out, attacked her, attacked the dog. Huge brouhaha. We had the hearing and uh, I decided that two out of three needed to be leashed and muzzled at all times. And... Uh, 
uh, Miss Donahue sent her newest employee with no animal experience. Well, she worked at the zoo, but she was the new lieutenant. And uh, she went to that hearing, came back, and said that, uh, uh, obviously told Miss Donahue that she felt that uh, none of the dogs should be deemed vicious and dangerous because she'd heard from the dog owner that she was going to take the dogs to Texas, that uh, the, the dog owner's mom had won the lottery in Texas and the dogs would be free, and if I deemed them vicious and dangerous, Texas might not take the dogs into the state. So, Miss Don. You start, uh, started uh, questioning me about my decision to deem the dogs vicious and dangerous and require that they were to be leashed and muzzled. And I said, well, have you read, have you listened to the audio of the tape? Have you looked at any of the, uh, uh, the file? And she says, well, no. And I said, well, and you're asking me <laughs> about all these things. And uh, I said, I'm supposed to tell the lady with a little white fluffy dog that we're not going to do anything to these dogs because someone with a very long criminal history who owns three pit bulls that she left in the open <laughs> trunk of a car on a, a very busy street said that her parents in Texas had won the lottery and everything's going to be fine. And I said, that's not acceptable. And uh, that's when it happened. Uh, that's when she made it very clear that I worked for her and that I would have to acquiesce to her, her demands. And uh, I said, well, I said no. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was a very rocky start, and um, from that day on, she wanted to take complete control of the hearing officer position, which, uh, while uh, technically I may have worked under uh, the director, the former director Rebecca Katz, she put it together. But the hearing officer's position has always been independent and didn't answer to anybody. If someone didn't like something the hearing officer did, they could appeal to superior court, which is another <laughs> can of worms because the superior court looks at it as an administrative hearing and it's not an administrative hearing. But that, that's another topic. Uh, but uh, uh, Ms. Donahue, w w w with no civil service experience or uh, public safety experience, uh, felt that she was going to take over everything having to do with dogs in the city and the hearing officer was under her dominion. Uh, I don't know if you wanted to get into this, but I wanted to step back a little bit. You, you spoke about Rebecca Katz leaving animal care control. Did you want, are you willing to share what you know about how that actually came about? Um, uh, well, I, I, I'm a huge fan uh, of Rebecca Katz uh, and, uh, and always will be. Uh, a bril brilliant woman and uh, very strong-willed. Uh, she used to say that she was a recovering attorney, uh, a city attorney, and um, uh, she got the position, and her boss was Naomi Kelly, the city administrator in San Francisco, also a very strong-willed person, and I think they clashed, <laughs> and it didn't go well. I, I, I wasn't at the meeting when it happened, but I, I think these were two uh, women that just felt that one of them had, I, <laughs> that's a mess, I'm, okay. I'm sorry. Right. I, it's right. a, right. uh, so, so since Virginia Donahue came on, uh, you described the first uh, exchange with her in a dispute over a decision, uh, but there were other incidents with her uh, where she was trying to exert influence. Well, first thing she did as director of animal care and control was tell the police chief, Greg Sir, that she also ran a boarding and training facility in San Francisco and that uh, Chief Sir had just gotten a puppy and that she'd be happy to board the dog when he went on vacations or, or, or train the dog or something like that. So that's the second thing she told me was, oh, by the way, I'm boarding the chief's dog. I'm taking care of the chief's puppy. Now, you read between the lines on something like that, <laughs> you're, you're basically being informed that I have the backing of the chief of police because I'm doing a big fat favor for him. And um, that she told everybody that. And she was having, uh, she wasn't happy with the head of the a vicious and dangerous dog unit, the sergeant there, and uh, she wanted to get rid of that person, and I have no idea, the, 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 the person was perfect for the job, um, but Miss Donahue decided to flex her muscles and uh, got rid of, had that person transferred out, and 
left the whole unit in, in quite a lurch. But, uh, but so, so that uh, brings up the question of when did you find out that Virginia Donahue had this conflict of interest by owning a private business? Did you know, know that when she came on board? I knew she was involved in Pet Camp. I didn't know she was an owner. Okay, uh, um, I, I believe she got the job. One of her strong suits um, for the position was the fact that she had experience running a boarding and training facility, an animal boarding and training. And since the city was going to be building a brand new uh, building for animal care and control, they felt it vital to have somebody uh, uh, with some sort of managerial experience in that uh, capacity. And, and uh, certainly the Greg Sur incident must have raised flags with you about the conflict, about what that conflict meant for the head of animal care and control, that you couldn't serve two interests. Well, the, the problem is the chief, everybody knows on the police command staff that the chief is <laughs> friendly with Miss Donahue because it, 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 like that. So how many other people are boarding, taking advantage? I don't know if the chief got a special rate. <laughs> uh, I, nobody wants to look into that. Probably none of my business, but I'm sure somebody would like to know. But the problem with that is the entire command staff knows now that, oh, whatever Miss Donahue wants, she gets because she's taking care of the chief's puppy. So hands off. If uh, Miss Donahue doesn't want to do this or she does want to do that or if she wants somebody transferred as a, uh, and she's throwing her weight around everybody, no nobody wants to get the chief mad at him. Uh, and, and so that's, that's how it gets kind of ugly. And it also raised questions about how animal care control treated the competitors to pet cat. Oh, the, yes, the, yes. There was uh, one, one amazing interest. And, and, and I've made it well known, but uh, uh, Miss Donahue has uh, laid it out that uh, she does not consider a dog attack that happens on a, in a grooming and training facility to be documented or to be uh, uh, given any attention, all right? That they're uh, grooming uh, veterinary hospitals, uh, and there was one other, but, and I understand that. If a veterinarian's giving a dog a shot and he gets nipped, okay, it's not a police, it, it, it's not a police issue. A dog trainer is attacked <laughs> and sent to the hospital at a training facility, I think that counts as a bite, but Miss Donahue uh, said it's not. She's had incidents at pet camp, I know of at least one, where someone got bit and injured out there, but because she doesn't consider that a dog bite or, or, or notable or even to make a police report, nobody pays attention to it. Now, something happened at one of her competitors in San Francisco, gentleman was sent to the hospital and her department requested a vicious and dangerous dog hearing I, and uh, I asked why if you don't consider incidents that occur at dog training facilities uh, to be noteworthy, why are you requesting uh, this? I didn't ask her, I asked the person at the uh, vicious and dangerous dog hearing. And uh, I didn't get an answer. Uh, I asked, tell me why you think this dog is vicious and dangerous. Let's, let's, let's just do that. And the uh, uh, animal care and control representative, I believe it was a sergeant, So, oh no, we don't think the dog is vicious and dangerous. And I said, well, why are we having this hearing? And it's like, well, we don't like their training techniques. And we think that they board, uh, border on cruelty. And I said, well, ye animal care and control handles cruelty complaints. Why are we here? Why did you drag the, everybody involved, the, the owners of your the competitor to pet camp, uh, the dog trainer and the dog owner, everybody's here because you don't like their training facilities. And uh, it just went against, it almost seemed like Miss Donahue sent her people out, made an exception for a standing rule just to harass one of their competitors. And I'm sure if you spoke to her, one of her competitors, they were outraged, they couldn't believe, they went to the ethics commission, but I'm sure we'll get to the uh, Ethics Commission in due course. <laughs> uh, well, that, there's the whole other side of that coin, though, and that's, that's the enforcement. Uh, I mean, how can the owner of a, of a pet boarding and training service enforce the law equally when she has to be concerned about private clients and the public? 
exactly, exactly. A, 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 a sticking point to this whole incident uh, with, with the, the competitor, um, they had a video of the attack, and uh, uh, I, I, I asked him to show me the video of the attack, and this was a sustained horrific. It, it's a very hard thing to watch, and the employee, the dog trainer, did everything he could to keep that dog from go, going further. And so after the video, my jaw is hanging down. I look over at Animal Care. Yes, there was a sergeant uh, and uh, the new lieutenant that we, we spoke about earlier. And he says, you're telling me that dog's not vicious and dangerous? And they go, nope. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> All right. Even though your department does not recognize attacks that happen on boarding and training facilities, we got to do something about that dog. So the implication is, I should just ignore that. That dog's going to get sent home and we're going to cross our fingers that nothing bad is going to happen. And I said, no. And apparently the, uh, the trainer had 21 stitches put in his arm. All right. I said, no. So I came to a voluntary agreement with the dog owner to leash and muzzle the dog and to continue with the training. And actually I have kind of, in these situations, I also ask them, do you want to own a dog that will do this? I mean, it's a tough conversation to have. And, uh, but I, I've had it frequently, but she was adamant that she was going to care for the dog. And uh, another twist to this, the person, the police officer who was running the vicious and dangerous dog unit, I said she was perfect for the job, it was for reasons like this. She convinced the dog owner to buy a house with a big backyard that she could secure. And that's what she did and hadn't heard anything from uh, the, the dog since. So uh, a lot of, lot of different dynamics in, in that, one, that one case. And then there were other incidents where, um, I think after that, where, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Virginia Don, you actually pressured you to, to change statements that you had actually made in your decision? Yeah, when the police are out in the field, they witness what they feel is an attack. They are, by code, allowed to have the dog impounded and held for a vicious and dangerous dog hearing. We had a case, a case happened where the police officers ordered animal care and control to impound the dog. And sometimes they don't. They say, well, we're full. And it's like, well, <laughs> that's, but that's enough. So they impounded the dog and they held it. Um, the uh, animal care and control decided, without even asking the officer why they had it impounded, that they didn't feel the dog was vicious and dangerous and they released the dog. We had the hearing. I heard the evidence. I felt the dog was vicious and dangerous, and I said, where's the dog? And I looked at animal care and control and said, oh, we don't know. The guy was homeless, and we let the dog go. And I wrote in my decision that I don't think that's a very good practice to do. I don't think animal care and control should be the one to decide to release a dog that's impounded by another agency. They should have at least sat everybody down and had a meeting. All right, I, I, I'm not inflexible. But to release a dog that turned out to be vicious and dangerous, and they've had trouble with that dog, dog since. So I wrote the decision and I spanked animal care and control a little bit in the decision. But there had to be a record somehow of, of you can't do this. Well, Ms. Donahue felt that, that all that language should have been removed and um, stating that the person who authorized the release, the deputy director, uh, 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 Diana Christensen, may be running for office in the future. She doesn't want it off on the internet because then she'd have to explain why she got this negative notice in an official uh, statement of decision. And I told Ms. Donahue, I've, that's my decision. I've put it out there. And then, um, yeah, I was uh, uh, harangued on many occasions by Ms. Donahue and Ms. Christensen for not revising a statement of decision I'd already signed and, and put out into the public. And another incident, if you don't mind t uh, talking about it, is the, uh, where she criticized you because you mentioned a statement from a public record about how ACC was not supposed to respond to, to complaints at Chrissy Field on federal park land. Oh, right. Uh, uh, <sighs> Miss Donahue had become frustrated with the dog owner. She had these big Newfoundlands. I mean, these, these and she had two, she, her and her husband, the Newfoundland owners, they had two RVs. And yeah, the dogs were 
kind of a nuisance. And um, one of them chased a, a dog around at Chrissy Field and got and came before me at Vicious and Dangerous Dog Court. And um, I basically had the talk with the, the dog owner and says, you've got to keep your dogs under control. You, you, you can't do that. Well, as I'm looking through the animal care and control records before, while I'm making my decision, I noticed that Miss Donahue had put into her uh, into the records for animal care and control not to respond for calls of these dogs, if uh, unless it was some sort of uh, the exact wording uh, escapes me, but some sort of major emergency. And the problem with that, if someone calls animal care and control and says, "Hey, there's dogs running loose out here, and they're harassing me or my dogs or something like that," then the person answering the phone at animal care and control, has, who makes the decision whether it's a big enough emergency, right? Or it, it was just the strangest thing to, uh, to see in the records to do not respond to calls or complaints about these dogs, unless it's an. Um, uh, and it's like, well. How, how do you do that? So uh, I, I called her on that and um, didn't get a response. In fact, wasn't that, I mean, later didn't she make a complaint about that? That, that you had, you had uh, I thought she had made a complaint later that, that you had actually criticized her and, and, and not, uh, yes, yeah, so you had quoted the statement in the decision. The dog got, the dogs got in trouble one of the dogs, they all look alike. So you have to take the word of the dog owner, which dog, which Newfoundland was involved. Well, I had a pretty good authority. The dog that hadn't been in trouble before got in trouble chasing. These, these were not serious, ser, serious, but they warranted a, a vicious and dangerous dog hearing. So I'm hearing the case. Miss Donahue sets up, stands up with a written statement saying that animal care and control feels that I should take all of her dogs away from her and, uh, that, uh, and that she would try to find homes for them. And uh, that I would deem this one particular dog, I can take dogs away from people if I feel that they are vicious and dangerous. And I can prohibit them from, well the hearing officer can prohibit someone from owning a dog in the future. But, uh, the city attorney really doesn't like to do that and, and uh, actually gave a training course in front of Miss Donahue and myself saying don't do that because I've been doing that in the past. She just didn't want to defend it. I thought it was a great idea to uh, uh, a dog that doesn't need to be destroyed but needs a new owner. If I deem the dog vicious and dangerous without destroying it, that means that person has to find another home for it. And that's how that works. So uh, I can see the rub, rub in it, but it saved a lot of dogs' lives that didn't do any fu future damage. They just needed an owner that would take care of them. Well, after that, Miss Donahue's in front of me saying, I want you to deem this dog vicious and dangerous, which it wasn't, and it was a minor incident. So she wanted me to deem the dog vicious and dangerous so I could use my power to prevent her from owning any other dogs, the other 10 dogs that she owned. And, uh, we, we got into a bit of a row on that. I said, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I was at the same training you were, and the city attorney says we really can't do that anymore. And now you're telling me to deem a dog that's not vicious and dangerous, vicious and dangerous, and then tell me to remove all of these ladies' dogs. I just thought that was totally unethical. And because of these problems you were having with the executive director, uh, the interference, uh, you, I don't know how much you want to speak about this. I would love to hear you speak about it. Um, you ended up uh, finding at least a couple of complaints, one with the ethics commissions and, and one as a whistleblower, didn't you? Right, right. Are you, are you okay with talking about that? Or? Well, I thought going to the ethics commission over, this was all about public safety and how it was affecting public safety, all right? Um, that's why I went to the, uh, the whistleblower saying that we've got problems. Uh, Miss Donahue is allegedly using her in power as the director of animal care and control to harass her competitors. Not only that, in animal care and control records, there's made mention of uh, stipends from uh, a pet camp to animal care and control, which appear to be monetary stipends, that they're mixing monies between 
pet camp and animal care and control. And I think that's highly unethical and very dangerous. So the abuse of power, uh, harassing her competitors by using her animal care and control, the, the enforcement division, and by accepting monies from Pet Camp, and then strangely enough, well, it's no surprise to anybody, but Pet Camp is the number one sponsor for animal care and control, and they brag about that on the animal care and control website. And I said, this is just a little too cozy. You know, and, and so I thought the Ethics Commission should take a look at it. Now, the city administrator defends Miss Donna Hughes being a partner of uh, a, a co-owner of uh, Pet Cam and by saying, well, her husband is running it all now. She has nothing to do with the day-to-day -day operations. And I said, well, stipends, <laughs> sponsorship, and they don't talk at the dinner table. I mean, the money that animal care, uh, that Pet Cam gets from city employees like the police chief, you know, wink, wink, nod, nod. Uh, that, that money goes into the same checking account, does it? So she benefits directly by pet camp doing well. And uh, it, it seems to be a no-brainer to everybody except the city administrator. So, uh, and I mentioned all this. I, I just didn't go straight to the whistleblower. I sat down with uh, representatives of the city administrator's office and I said, hey, we got a big problem. And I, I had a list and we went through it and um, they arranged a, 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 a meeting between m me, Carl Friedman, the former director, and Ms. Donahue. And we went down the list and Ms. Donahue just wasn't having anything, anything of it. Uh, so basically, eventually after being stonewalled, and then kill the messenger <laughs> was pretty much what the city administrator's uh, uh, attitude was. I went to the ethics commission and said, this, is, this, has, got, this has got to stop. And th but you come to find out that the chairman of the ethics commission <laughs> is appointed by the city administrator. And it's like, well, isn't that cozy? So I, do, I did have a pending complaint, and I gave them all the information. I gave them the records, and um, pretty quiet. It's been uh, eight, nine months now. So the controller's office, uh, the city administrator used to work with the controller, <laughs> the, the city controller, their best buds, and uh, that doesn't go very far. As a matter of fact, you could do a whole series on how the San Francisco whistleblower unit needs a whistleblower investigation, okay? This, this is just, if, if you blow the whistle on somebody who's like downtown, they can fix it, and it's, it's, it's just too cozy. It's just too cozy. So yes, I did have complaints with uh, the Ethics Commission, and I did have complaints with, 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 the, control, uh, uh, with the whistleblower office, too. But as far as you know, they, those have gone no place. Have gone no place. As a matter of fact, I filed a police report uh, 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 sent to the uh, district attorney's office, uh, Miss Donahue's pressuring me to change my decisions is unethical and illegal. And uh, so, but I haven't heard anything from the district attorney's office because it, it's such a steep learning curve and you're just getting into the mud. And at the end of the day, uh, the city's thinking, why are we why are we wrestling in the mud with this when we can just stiff arm these guys, hold them at you know, arm's length, and ignore them, and it'll go away? And we we've got the juice, we've got the people in all the right places. Okay, it's uh, you know with that old expression, you can't fight city hall. Well, this is the city hall they were talking about <laughs> when they came up with that phrase. But but that's and that's me speaking out of frustration. The fact that. Uh, because Ms. Donahue, for example, does not wish to operate uh, her emergency services between 1 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the morning, animals are dying on the street. Police officers are dealing with vicious dogs they don't know what to do with. Uh, they, they've, they, they, uh, I explained recently the police made an arrest at two, uh, 1 o'clock in the morning at a Safeway. The dog bit a person and the dog owner was trying to shoplift. Uh, it, it, was, it was a huge mess. But the police officers had this dog, and they didn't know what to do with it. They called animal care and control, but they don't even answer the, the emergency line. So the police officers had to take the dog to a private uh, emergency and talk them in to keeping the dog. Well, come to find out, had someone answered the phone at animal care and control, the dog that they had in the back of their police car and had... Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry. <coughs> I'm making that running. 
Oh, okay. Okay. All right. I looked at Lenny. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. So. So the police were not informed that the dog that they're walking around with, and then begging a private emergency veterinary hospital to keep the dog until the morning until someone from animal care and control shows up to work to take the dog was in fact a vicious and dangerous dog. So you're putting people at risk. People are dying in the gutter. Uh, uh, animals are dying in the gutters because if a dog gets hit in the middle of the night and there's no one to call. Uh, if, it's, if it's in pain, it's up to the police or whoever finds them to try to take them to an emergency service. Animal Care and Control feels that, uh, well, according to Ms. Donahue, she says she'd have to hire three more officers to staff, the, staff those, and uh, that's ridiculous. Uh, before the budget cuts years ago, uh, you just gave someone the night telephone, and they could advise anybody who called the emergency hotline including the police, what to do with the dog, or I'll get into my truck, my take-home truck, and then I'll come and deal with it. You just put someone on call. But uh, Ms. Donio has no experience in staffing a, a public safety unit. So, uh, And even when you tell her how easy this would be to solve, uh, you just get a blank stare. Well, in fact, uh, who's, uh, does anybody have any real law enforcement background at animal care and control? None. None. Public safety background? None. None. And, and, and that's what's so vexing. Um, they hired uh, the, the uh, uh, lieutenant of animal care and control in their public safety division. Uh, powers of arrest, uh, uh, in, investigating cruelty cases, running those cases through the district attorney's office, having to make a lot of decisions, writing search warrants, something like that. They went out and hired a lady whose only experience in this was working at the San Francisco Zoo. And she was in hot water out there because she was involved in that baby gorilla that got tragically killed in the, the, the trap door shutting like that. And she was named as being partially responsible. She fought it. They didn't know what to do with it. She found a soft landing at Animal Care and Control. So you've got a lieutenant in charge of a dozen public safety officers, never written a traffic ticket, <laughs> right? Doesn't have any experience in this area, but that's, that's just an example uh, from the director, uh, deputy director, operations manager, and um, I believe that lieutenant is now the captain of uh, enforcement services. No, no, nobody has any idea of what to do there. From your experience, I, we've never talked about this before, you know that uh, animal care control gets into the newspapers uh, usually through puff pieces about what good work they're doing. And one of those uh, aspects is, is uh, animal abuse cases that they become involved right. in. In your experience, because I'm, I'm trying to get a handle on this, uh, to, in your experience, what role has animal care and control played in animal abuse cases? Because what I've read and what I see, it's the police department that ends up being the investigators in animal abuse cases, or is that not the... No, well, absolutely. Animal care and control is, they don't have the training or the experience. I was involved in one horrible incident that happened very close to animal care and control. Somebody, they found a puppy that had been stomped to death, had its jaw broken, had its teeth kicked out, cigarette burns in it, and uh, animal care and control said, well, this is a cruelty investigation, we're gonna do it. Now that person who was running the vicious and dangerous dog unit that Miss uh, Donahue had removed, off before she was removed, she offered the police services, says, I can get you plainclothes officers because they knew that the potential uh, person who had done all this was living in a homeless encampment near animal care and control. And uh, she offered the police uh, assistance to go in there and we can find out who did it and we can gather the evidence and we can get a conviction. And they said, no, we don't like you. <laughs> Uh, Virginia Donahue doesn't like you, Sergeant Hicks, so we're going to ignore it. The animal care and control officers, the captain and the lieutenant, they walked into the homeless encampment and basically said, who wants to squeal on this guy, <laughs> right? Well, this guy is a bad news. Everybody pretty much knew he did it, right? But that was their 
investigation. They walked in uniform, asked people to squeal on this, and they couldn't come up with anything and nothing was resolved. Now, if it had been handled by the police department, uh, they would know when and how to interview people, and especially the where, <laughs> not in front of the whole encampment. And, uh, and that was, so the guy got off scot-free like that. The incident with the, ch the small dog being thrown out of the Stockton garage like that, animal care and control didn't convict that guy. That was all the police department. And uh, they, they, they don't know what to do. And so, but you'll read in the paper, well, well we assisted the police department. And it's like, <laughs> oh, okay, fine, fine. I'll give you an example about a puff piece recently. We, uh, one, one of the new hearing officers that Miss uh, Donahue hired and trained, um, he, he made some uh, derogatory statements about uh, Asian immigrants. Uh, and uh, while, while all that was happening, a n news reporter wanted to do a, a, a piece on the vicious and dangerous hearing process. And by that time, my contract was still in effect, so she called me. And then she was also going to call the, uh, the other hearing officer, uh, who had ma made these statements. And I tried to tell her that w y you need to, uh, <laughs> I got to back up. I, I got to tell the story a little differently. All right. She wanted to do a piece on the vicious and dangerous hearing process. And uh, I told her, well, before you do this, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of dysfunction. There's a lot of infighting and you need to know about this. And uh, she says, well, Okay, well, she didn't want to talk to me, so she talked to this other guy, and uh, the other hearing officer, uh, uh, Foster, um, I, I forget his, Jeff Foster. Uh, Jeff, is that? Yeah. Yes, Jeff Foster. And um, did this wonderful, glory puff piece on, oh, you know, I, you know, what a, you know, what a great process, what a great guy, and this and that. And then two weeks later, he makes very derogatory comments about Asians, Americans, and uh, it just, uh, it, it was, uh, it, but there was no follow-up on it. Once the puff piece is out there, this is a guy <laughs> that they interviewed and made look like he walks on water and he's the friend of the community and turns out making racially insensitive, and running his court, his hearings, uh, in a similar fashion, so. And they continued to let that hearing officer serve. Oh, that officer. was amazing, that, that, was, that was amazing. The day, the day that he made those statements, uh, referring to uh, Asian immigrants as uh, FOBs, in front of a police officer, the deputy director of animal care and control, and that lieutenant of animal that I, I keep referring to, um, the police officer wrote a memo saying, this is intolerable, this is racism, this is bias, this is bigotry, it's not to be tolerated, and he wrote out the memos, he sent it up the chain of the command to his lieutenant, the captain, and it got, got, got downtown like that. It wasn't until a week later that the deputy director found out that he had written those because she had ignored it. She didn't do anything. She figured, he works for us, we hired him, we trained him, just no, 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 no problem there. So, he, so he's got a problem with Asians, okay, especially immigrants. That, you know, uh, so uh, I, I was still a hearing officer at the time, and this isn't about sour grabs, but this is about how do you, once someone makes a statement like that, how do you protect him? Why would you want to protect him? Because there were definitely, there were going to be more Asians coming before him, and they indeed were, after he'd made those statements, and those statements had been reported. But the city administrator's office apparently felt that it's no big deal. And uh, I think he held four more hearings uh, with multiple cases at, at each hearing before somebody finally came to their senses and says, no, wait a minute. This is this this can't happen. So that's just dumbfounding. I I, I just uh, I, I and I just don't understand why the deputy director heard it face to face. Wouldn't go to the director and say we can't have him as hearing officer anymore. He's shown a racial bias. But uh, either they didn't have that conversation or she didn't bring it up. But it. Uh, it, it bothered the, uh, the, the, the animal care and control lieutenant, 
But uh, that's, I, yeah, it, I, I have no explanation for that. So, well, this brings up a really good question. So, uh, in my head, uh, <laughs> Uh, so you mentioned you, you made complaints to the Ethics Commission, to the whistleblower unit of the Controller's Office. You, you've tried to contact the press about some of these problems as well, right? Right, right. Uh, I, uh, early in my career, m the, the commander that brought me downtown with, with, with my partner, with Sergeant Herndon, we got embroiled in this big fiasco about parking tax revenues at Candlestick Park. And it was very down and dirty, and there were a lot of powerful city people involved in it. And uh, uh, one day, our police car, which was assigned to us, was broken into. And they took all of the files that we had from the tax collector's office having to, to relate with this. So we said, well, the police aren't protecting us. Someone in the police department did this. So we went to our representative at the police officers union and uh, said, we're in trouble. We were told to do something and now they're coming after us. And he said, the only way you can do this is to go to the press. And we did. And uh, it, it caused a big kerfuffle, but eventually people were taken care of. And, and so I understand, I understand how this works. Um, so at this late date in my career, I learned two things. The press needs to know. And what we didn't do back in 1991 during the parking scandal was we didn't go to the grand jury. This time, with the whole AC3 thing, I made a complaint to the grand jury about it as well. And uh, very disappointing. I guess you have good grand juries and you have, <laughs> it, it's, just, it, it's just a coin toss, um, but... Uh, but you've given this information, a lot of this information to the press and you've never had them actually run a story on, on these ACC city administrator issues. Right, right. No, they're, they're, they're familiar with it. They, they got uh, uh, the documents that the police officer wrote about the bias from the hearing officer were made public by animal care and control, <laughs> okay? They got sent to just about everybody in the press who was completely ignored. It was a non-starter, especially when uh, uh, it, be it becomes so political. Uh, London Breed, uh, well, she's running for mayor. She'd already taken a knock about being anti-Chinese or something like that. So she was trying to put out that fire. And the last thing needed to be a, a, an issue, a racial issue during a political season. And somebody's pointing fingers at somebody. And um, I, I have faith in the press, but I, I, don't, I, I, I don't understand this. But, uh, and again, the point is, People are being put at risk. Animals are dying needlessly. That's, that's the bottom line. And nobody cares. And so maybe to, to get to the optimistic part, maybe. Uh, so what, what kind of remedies do you see? What, what, what could be done in terms of both animal care and control and the uh, vicious and dangerous dog hearing process? Well, everything that's wrong with animal care and control could be fixed in a week. <laughs> there's, there's, there, there's, there, there's a whole, whole list of things, but it involves a change in management, all right? Uh, the conflict of interest, the abuse of power, the mingling of the monies, uh, uh, the, the ineptitude on, on the public safety unit, uh, uh, not being open from one to six in the morning, that could be fixed with a phone call right now, okay? And actually, the grand jury report came out and said, we don't understand why you're not open. This, this, this is baffling to us. Well, the Board of Supervisors accepted the grand jury report. says, well, I guess we don't know either. Next case, right? So these things can be figured. The, uh, the sad thing about the vicious and dangerous dog hearing is Ms. Uh, Ms. Donahue screwed it up so badly. It was a mediation process. It was something where you got neighbors and neighbors and you didn't need lawyers. You could, you could come to some sort of a s understanding. Uh, my job was to get everybody on the same page. The dog owner understands their responsibilities and, and what they needed to do. And they would hear it from me in front of the person who was making the complaint. We'd leave all together knowing that we're all on the same page, things like that. Miss Donahue, uh, she fumbled it around. They took it away. 
they took the vicious dog hearing process away from her. She made such a hash of it that uh, the, the controller's office got involved, public health got involved, the city administrator got involved. City administrator was scheduling, but animal care and control was picking the judges and the controller's office was ducking any whistleblower units. And then I don't, you know, it was such a fiasco that currently the old offices of filling complaints that monitor the police department, they've been renamed to something else. They are now, they have an attorney now, has, it's been decided that that attorney is going to be the vicious and dangerous hearing officer, regardless of having, has lots of legal experience, no animal experience. And I don't know about mediation experience. So a process that was supposed to be informal where the rules of evidence don't apply, attorneys were allowed but not encouraged, is now being run by attorneys, and now the vicious and dangerous hearing process, which was a, more of a mediation, at least that's how I looked at it, uh, problem solving, uh, I, I believe the people are gonna be sworn in now before they give testimony at vicious and dangerous dog hearings. There will be cross-examination, and you better bring an attorney, and that's a tragedy. It was not set up to be this. And that is the tragedy, something to keep the lawyers out of it, to keep the expense, because lawyers are expensive. And now it, it's set up for and by lawyers. And, and that's just a shame, just because Miss Donahue wanted to have control over everything. Once she got control over it, she, she, like I said, she made such a hash out of it that people finally had to come in take it away from her, give it to somebody else. And uh, it, it, it's, just, it's just a shame. We had, we had a vicious and dangerous dog hearing process. Well, I was involved, I get calls from all over the country and the world, how do you do this? Why is it so successful? And I'd say, well, our health code is very ambiguous, saying that it's an informal hearing, laws of evidence aren't applied. Uh, we had a lot of wiggle room. And uh, now it is being handled like an administrative hearing. And, uh, and, and that's just a shame. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, just a shame. And uh, getting back to the animal care and control, I thought you, you had some really good ideas about how it's possible that animal care control could be restructured in some way. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Easiest thing in the world, and a lot of communities do this, the, most of the officers, the, uh, the, the public safety officers working for animal care and control, they're very dedicated and, and, and they're on the ball, but they have no support or people that know how to, how to uh, fill out a search warrant, how to run it through the DA's office. So it would make a lot of sense and it wouldn't cost the city anything to include the enforcement officers to work with the police department, put them under the umbrella. The animal enforcement officers work for the police department. So then you'd have a grouchy old police sergeant running those officers and they can tell them when to arrest, when not to arrest, how to do this, how to set it up, when to send it to an investigator and have all the support of the crime lab, uh, of the, uh, the, the attorneys, the legal division, all of the assets the police department have would, so the animal care and control officers could be trained how to do a cruelty. So it, it would make sense and it wouldn't cost anything. You could have them, their vans distributed to all, all the district police stations so they'd be there uh, immediately. And uh, you would still, which means what do you do with the dog when you pick it up? Well, you still have to have a municipal shelter or you contract out like they did before with the SPCA. You contract out the municipal shelter to be run by a, a contracted business. Someone like the SPCA who knows how to take care of animals, who knows how to treat animals. Uh, um, they have qualified veterinarians, uh, not like the cruise ship doctors that they have. Well, now I'm gonna get in trouble with cruise ship doctors, <laughs> but the, 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 the veterinarians at Animal Care and Control, I, I, I've, I've just, uh, nobody's looking at the animals that die after simple uh, spay or neuter uh, for adoption purpose, and, and then the animal dies, and it's like, oh, well, sorry, uh, I, I, I can't treat this, I can't treat that. The, uh, it's, nobody's looking over their shoulder. So uh, I, I trust uh, the SPCA much more than I do those people that are animal care and control, because SPCA has to answer for the quality 
uh, of the care that they give for their animals. Animal care and control doesn't. Isn't that, ha, I can't, all right. So what you do is you put the public safety officers under the umbrella with the support and resources and guidance of the police department for field services and then the, uh, uh, the adoption processes, the strays, um, and all the uh, uh, contracted uh, shelter people would have to do would be to hold vicious dogs un until they have, have the hearings, okay? But as far as impounding strays, adoptions, things like that, they're much better suited agencies in, or uh, businesses in San Francisco suited to do what Animal Caring Trail is failing to do so miserably. So I, 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 that brings me lastly, I, I think, uh, to this whole issue of uh, you have this organization, Animal Care and Control, uh, their energies go into a certain part of, of, of what their actual brief is in terms of animal control and care. Right. Uh, but they're being given this uh, $150 million uh, new facility. It's going to cost the San Franciscans $150 million. How does that relate to what you're saying in terms of what, what they're not really doing well. They're not doing the safety part right. They're not doing the enforcement right. They're doing the, the, you know, the adoption and the care of the animals right to a certain extent. Uh, but they're give, being given this, new, this huge new expensive facility. Do you see a need for that a facility? Let me put it that way. When, when, as you say, SPCA, for instance, could be an independent contractor for some of those services. F from the people I've spoken to, for half, now, now the, prior to all the interest and in the costs of building this, I believe it's up to close to $90 million. For half that, you could go out to Hunter's Point, <laughs> build a brand new shelter from ground up that would ha have, house many more dogs and many more cats, easy parking, <laughs> easy exercise for, for the animals, fresh air, for half to start it. Uh, so, I understand that they may have outgrown the facilities that they have, uh, but I don't understand moving into a, a historically, they call it historical building, that they have to retrofit, they have to remodel, and it will hold fewer dogs and cats, and they'll have extra space in the back that they're thinking that they're going to rent it out to a retail establishment. Now, if, now everything about this premise is... But from the, so if you're going to house fewer dogs and cats, why don't you just annex the back part of the building? And I mean, that's a common sense thing, but they want to rent, out, rent it out to an Arby's or something like that to help offset the cost of the, the building. Uh, it's, it's the most ridiculous... I, I, it's just mind-boggling. I know there's politics afoot at this. Muni wants the Animal Care and Control building. Muni runs a lot of City Hall, okay? So if Muni wants the, new, the old Animal Care and Control buildings, and oh, they're moving out of the Animal Care and Control building because it needs to be seismically upgraded, right? Well, they're going to have to do it anyway if they're going to put the Muni people in there. I guess they need more pool tables and ping pong tables and places to sleep while they're on call, okay? I, I don't know why they need another building, but Muni wants it. And they worked a deal downtown somewhere, said, we'll get it to you. Uh, people saying we need a new animal care and control shelter, so we'll, we'll you know, s some, something out there. But, you know, the bottom line is animal concerns whether it's for the safety and protection of the animals or the safety and protection of the humans, is a very, very low priority in the city. And, um, it, it, it's, and it's a shame. And it's a shame. And uh, so um, you're going to spend $150 million on something that's going to be less than what you have now and you're being moved because Muni needs a shuffleboard court somewhere? I, I don't know what they plan on using it for, 
but they brag about the pool tables. They own the barn across the street and the tire, <laughs> and they just want to make it the big Muni central area, but they brag about the pool tables and ping pong tables they have <laughs> across the street, so maybe they want to put a gym in. I don't know, but, uh, uh, and I know I get heat for that. Well, I really, so, uh, and that, but, but the bottom line is animal welfare and um, public safety from animals is only an issue in San Francisco when somebody gets hurt. And the sad thing now, Miss Donahue has made it to the point just, I don't know why, I, I, I can't believe she's an evil person, but what she has done has, she has erased all of the safeguards, all the improvements that went in after Diane Whipple was mauled to death, all the reporting, all of the safeguards, and, and we are less prepared to prevent a serious attack in San Francisco than we were before uh, uh, Diane Whipple was mauled to death. And um, Miss Donahue is to blame for that, and the people that are supported and defended Miss Donahue are to blame for that. And uh, time to move to Texas, I guess. <laughs> On that note, uh, this Texan <laughs> says, thank you, John. That was really great. I hope. Is there I, anything you want to add? Anything uh, that I didn't cover that, you, that you, you, you want to get out there? Oh, no, I'm sure I've said more than enough. But uh, it, you know, the, the thing, it's just a shame. It's so unnecessary. It, it, it's just so unnecessary. I mean, when she told you to pound sand when you're just asking her for help, my... I, and I talked to Carl Friedman, and she says, John, I would have gone out there and met Mr. Black, <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right? <laughs> I would have met him. I would have talked. He, he says, do you understand what civil service means? You have to be a civil servant, <laughs> okay? Nobody in animal care and control has been a civil servant in that they have protected public safety. And, uh, and it shows. And it shows, um, and uh, the hubris, um, the, the incompetence, and the hubris uh, the accompanying it is is just it's just jaw dropping. But uh, I agree. I agree. Okay. We can go off the record. Um, <laughs>